hastily organized, the American inquiry failed to ask the right questions. Titanic surviving officers stonewalled, as did Ismay himself. Several experienced sea captains were called to give evidence regarding the wisdom of steaming at full speed through an ice field. But they all said the same thing. Maintaining full speed in the vicinity of ice was perfectly normal. And on the night in question, the icebergs could be seen at between five and six miles distant. It never occurred to anyone to ask the simple question, in that case, why did the Titanic hit an iceberg? When the surviving crew got back to England, they naturally expected to go straight home to their loved ones. Instead, they were all herded into a railway shed and held for nearly 24 hours before being made to sign pieces of paper. A lot of them were under the impression that they were signing the Official Secrets Act. Was someone trying to suppress something here, some vital piece of information? Remember what it is you've put your names to. If there's any talk of the ship being swamped in Belfast, or any stories of insurance fraud going on, then there will be 20 years of His Majesty's pleasure awaiting you and no job to come out to when it's over. So, think on this when you see your wives and sweethearts. Ismay, Lightholler and the other surviving officers all came back to England on the steamship Adriatic. There can be little doubt as to the main subject of conversation on their voyage, they were all to be star witnesses in the forthcoming British inquiry. Now it is unlikely that a fraud of such immense proportions could have been undertaken without the collusion of the authorities, notably the British government, as we shall see later when we look at the inquiry. In fact, it makes perfect sense for the government of the day, under Prime Minister Lord Asquith, to have colluded in a cover-up. You'll never believe what they've just done. How many? I'm told 1,500. The position is simply this, Prime Minister. The White Star Line is on the verge of bankruptcy. Now, if White Star were forced to go into liquidation, the Harland and Poolfjord in Belfast would also be placed in a very precarious position, perhaps even forced to close down. Now, that means that 20,000 men will be laid off, not to mention the effect on all the subsidiary and dependent industries. Quite frankly, it is a political situation we cannot afford, Prime Minister. Alienate the Irish and we will most certainly lose seats in Belfast. The Fenians, the Republicans will seize the opportunity. And with our majority gone, we will undoubtedly lose the next election, Prime Minister. There is the chance of a blunder here of unprecedented proportions. We are going to have to go along with this, Prime Minister. I will not see a stain put upon the British government. Not for the White Star Line, not for Holland and Wolf, not for the Irish, and certainly not for the interests of J.P. Morgan. I would also remind you, Prime Minister, that as part of the arrangement for an American company to acquire the White Star Line, J.P. Morgan agreed that this government could requisition his ships as Royal Naval Reserves should the need arise. I would also remind you, Prime Minister, that the situation in Europe is becoming ever more doubtful. If the White Star Line were to go into liquidation, the major creditor would be J.P. Morgan himself. Now, as both owner and banker, he would certainly exercise his rights to seize his assets. And we would lose all those ships, Prime Minister. It's a sad day for England when the policies of a British government are dictated by greedy and ruthless businessmen. And if it ever became public, doubtless you have someone in mind to run the show? Yes. I thought we could bring Mersey out of retirement. He's reliable, he knows how the system works, he's discreet, and he will do what needs to be done. My son is called to the bar. I would be more comfortable if he were there to keep an eye on things. 
course, Prime Minister. We'll find employment for him in the Attorney General's office. Very well, then. But neither I nor the administration know anything about it. So, the Board of Trade inquiry was to be conducted by Lord Mersey, President of the Board of Trade and no stranger to the art of cover-up. Since the enormous loss of life was in part due to outdated Board of Trade regulations regarding the number of lifeboats to be carried by ships and the safety of ships at sea generally, it was hardly likely that the inquiry was going to be too concerned with uncovering the truth, the Board of Trade being both plaintiff and defendant in the case. The hearings were held at the Scottish Drill Hall in London, where the acoustics were so bad that spectators in the public galleries found it difficult to hear everything that was said. Lord Mersey had complained about the unfortunate choice of venue, but then again it had been booked by his son. Harold Sanderson, representing Harland and Wolfe, repeatedly made the mistake of referring to the Titanic as the Olympic. As for Lord Mersey himself, he simply didn't ask or allow to be asked the right questions. The press, who were there throughout the hearings and could have done something about it, were more interested in the scandal surrounding the lucky escape of J. Bruce Ismay. Other expert naval officers told Lord Mersey that even on a moonless night there'd be no difficulty spotting an iceberg from as far away as six or even ten miles. Remember, the full turning circle of the Titanic at top speed was only three quarters of a mile. The whole British inquiry was a whitewash. Captain Smith would not be blamed because he was no longer alive and could not defend himself. The lookouts were not to blame. The design and construction of the Titanic was not to blame. Neither were her officers or her owners. In fact, no one was to blame, except Captain Lord. Captain Lord stood alone. If Lord Mersey heard anything at the inquiry that he didn't like, he simply ignored it. She looked like a small tramp steamer about five miles away. They were firing rockets just after midnight. Altogether, she fired eight rockets, and all white, and rose no further than the masthead. I think we are all of the opinion that the distress signals, which were seen from the deck of the Californian, were in fact the distress signals from the Titanic. I went down below to Captain Lord, who was sleeping in the chart room. He asked me again if I was sure there was no colour in the rockets. So I said, no, they were all white. I think the onus of proof in this matter is upon the Californian. That it will be for the Californian to satisfy us that they were not the signals of the Titanic. <laughs> 